with my life is a miracle. Every child has a story of, of God's love to share. Shalom world, tune into God's love story. Everybody can grow in their Christian life, discerning what is my way in life. But everybody's called to holiness, that's the point. I'm Father Max Polak. I was born in the United States. My parentage, however, was Polish. All my grandparents were born in Poland. I only got to know one of my grandparents, uh, my grandmother on my mother's side. The others had died before I was born. I grew up in a Catholic family. Uh, they practiced. We were not well off. My father was a factory worker. He had had little opportunity for education in Poland because of very difficult times. I had a brother and a sister. They were much older than myself. We got along well, but of course they went off and got married and so on, and I was the Benjamin of the family, you know, left at home. I went to state schools all my life. Um, I couldn't afford private education. However, the state schools were very good, and I got quite a good education. When I finished my high school, uh, at that point of time, I had a great interest in aircraft, uh, and uh, I wanted to do engineering, uh, aeronautical engineering. I was accepted to MIT in Boston, and I began my studies there. MIT was uh, an interesting environment because, you know, it's high level engineering, science, that sort of environment. I suppose it just challenged me to a certain extent, and especially like my second year, that the environment, even though there were people of faith there, obviously, and even among the staff, I met some very good Catholics among the staff. There was firstly one particular priest who came to the campus to hear confession. And he spoke to me of this center called Elmbrook, uh, which was located in Cambridge near the Harvard campus. And uh, he said this was a place where university students came together, they received input in relation to their faith, they enjoyed each other's company. There were ups and downs over those years. You know, the bit of darkness perhaps. I never gave up the practice of the faith. So there was the overall environment of quite materialistic or empiricist, you know, science, science, science. Uh, and uh, I, I think that affected me to some degree. And then I had a bit of a crisis maybe of wanting to be an aeronautical engineer in the end and things of that sort. There were low moments in my life during university studies when probably the second year was the lowest. And then things went up again, you know. I also met in those early years of uh, my university, Opus Dei, which is a Catholic organization made up mainly of lay people. And I think also the contact with Opus Dei was a great help to me through that more difficult period of second year uni. Uh, there was a good Catholic uh, a chaplaincy on campus and I became involved in that. All of those things opened my horizons, opened my eyes, seeing the compatibility of faith with with scholarly studies, with science, uh, and so on and so forth. And I continue my interest in science, I continue my interest in aviation, in uh, space uh, exploration, I like astronomy. My research, uh, in the end, was in the area of satellite drag. It was a period of time when uh, NASA was interested in finding out more accurately how to predict the lifetime of these lower satellites. There are a couple of teams at MIT who are working on this project and NASA was funding them. And I got involved in, in one of them, but something else did happen. And that was that even though I joined with the, with the intention of remaining a lay person, continuing with my engineering, working in engineering, they posed to me the possibility of being a priest of Opus Dei. They didn't obviously force me or anything of that sort. They just said, would you be prepared to think about becoming a priest? 
in Opus Dei, because we do need a certain number of priests who understand the spirituality, who live the spirituality. And I said, yes. And so are you prepared to go to Rome and prepare for the priesthood? And I said, well, yes. I went to Rome in 1968, a very funny thing, because uh, of course I had to fly to Rome. Even though I had completed a master's degree in aeronautical engineering, I had never been in a plane before. <laughs> and it was my first flight, <laughs> so that was exciting. Anyway, so I, I uh, arrived in Rome, and um, well, I knew no Italian, and I had tried to learn some Spanish so as to be able to understand language of the founder of Opus Dei, Jose Maria Escriva, Saint Jose Maria, who was alive at that time. And we knew we were going to be able to spend some time with him. The first six months were pretty tough going. And because uh, I'm trying to learn Spanish, I'm trying to understand what's going on, right? And uh, sure enough, very soon we had a get together with Saint Jose Maria and, and it was wonderful and exciting and everything, but People had to translate afterwards, you know, what he said. The experience overall, of course, was enriching. I made great friendships there. Uh, we were about 100 students from all over the world. We had some very good teachers. I got to know Rome a bit. That was fascinating. It's just an amazing city. In those years, that we were, it was called the Roman College. It was called the Roman College. So you had people there. The majority of them would become priests eventually, but some of them were not going to become priests. They were doing the theology subjects so that they would be able to teach as laymen. So some of those men went back to their various countries eventually as laymen, and, but they had the qualifications to be able to teach philosophy, theology, and so on. Then I went to Spain, and I continued my studies in Spain at the University of Navarre, which is a wonderful university. It's a corporate work of Opus Dei. I met so many families, young people, worked in a youth club in a, a sort of a working class neighborhood of the city of Pamplona. Um, wonderful people. And uh, I had a wonderful time there. During that time, I was able to hear Jose Maria speak on numerous occasions. And that was just wonderful because I saw the sort of person he was. He, he was cheerful. He was very convinced. You know, he, had, he certainly knew what he was on about. He spoke to us in very sim simple terms. Mm, he had a great sense of humor. He would make us laugh at times. He would remember old stories. So that was a great privilege, of course. And also, I did have, I did have a, a job teaching English in the university, and I made a little bit of an income through that. Not very much, but uh, uh, that, was, that was good. And that went on for four years until I completed my postgraduate studies. Then they were, I was asked if I could go back to the U.S. for a period of time to help out, actually in the same center where I met Opus Dei. So I became sort of like the assistant director of Elmbrook Study Center. And that was great because it was back into my old environment, being with university students and so on were coming around and renewing my contact with the, the members of Opus Dei in Boston. And uh, yeah, so that was 10 months. And then the call came. Uh, can you come back now and get the immediate preparation for ordination? 13th of July of 1975, I was ordained. I spent about another six months in Barcelona placed in different situations of priestly activity um, to get experience, um, the sorts of apostolates that Opus Dei does. When I first joined Opus Dei, they did have difficult understanding what was the nature of my vocation, right? Because I, at that stage, I, I was not intending to become a priest. I was not becoming a priest. I was going to become a lay person in Opus Dei, an engineer, and so on. But I wasn't going to get married because I made a commitment 
as a member of the work not to get married. I mean, it, most people in Opus Dei do get married, and that's another way to live the commitment. It's the same vocation, but uh, different uh, circumstances. When we were in Barcelona, the second stage, second phase of the period, something very um, emotional happened. And that was the death of Jose Maria. You know, we were shocked, you know, because it was something completely unexpected. And that began an emotional period of those last weeks. We were 54 in all, men from different countries of the world. And we were the last group that had been invited to the priesthood by the founder. I was in Barcelona, they approached me and said, well, would you be prepared to go to Australia? So that came as a surprise, you know, because I was thinking all the time I'd be going back permanently to the U.S. I thought, I said, yes, I, I'm ready for everything. I mean, whatever is needed, and if that's what's needed at the moment. I arrived in March of 1976, Sydney, no, didn't know anything about Australia. So. I, uh, I knew some names of cities, but that's about it. I was asked to be the chaplain, or the first of all, the assistant chaplain, then the chaplain later, of Warren College at the University of New South Wales. I'm surrounded by students, you know, university students again. I had a lot of engineering faculties, so I felt at home in that sense. I thought I would understand the students very easily because they're all speaking English. I've had the challenge of it, Spanish, Italian, now I'm coming to an English-speaking country. But at the beginning, it was very hard to understand what they're saying because they talked very quickly. So I couldn't catch the jokes and, and I missed a lot of things. And anyway, I got over it. But then, of course, it became very, very good. So I was very happy to be among young people, university students. Not all of them were doing engineering, all sorts of disciplines. Some were med students doing law. But by and large, it was a great experience. And um, many good things happened there during, uh, in that college. Uh, there were Catholics who didn't practice when they first came, and they started to practice again. The priests are there to support the lay people, okay? And we have our role, but the, the sacraments, confession, mass, classes, spiritual direction, right? But also they get direction and guidance from lay people as well. There was a uh, student who started coming around the chaplaincy. He didn't have much formation, right? And he hadn't been confirmed. Anyway, the good bishop was coming to the campus one year that I was there, and so he got prepared for confirmation. And, uh, and then he started coming around the center of Opus Day as well. I used to catch up with him. The, uh, lame, some of the laymen in the center would, were good friends of his. And uh, anyway, time went on. He also saw his vocation to Opus Dei as a single member. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he, and then he, he worked professionally in New Zealand for a number of years. He was approached and asked whether he would be prepared to be a priest of Opus Dei. And, and sure enough, he went off and he got ordained. Well, now that priest is a bishop. <laughs> Little did I know when I first met this university student that one day he would be a bishop, you know. Years later, I was asked to do something that most priests of Opus Dei are not asked to do, and that's become a parish priest. And that was in West Melbourne. We had to prepare the couples, not alone, because we had married couples, very well-prepared married couples, who were also involved in giving preparation to these largely young couples. The first talk, I used to get them to reason out, to reason out what a marriage should be. Forget about Catholic, you know, gospel, right? just out of reason. What can we work out about what a good marriage should be? So, you know, I, I get the four points across that it's one to one, one man, one woman. It's, uh, you know, it's lifelong, exclusive, faithful and exclusive, and uh, it's open to having children. Those four points, okay? And then after the second talk, I would talk about what did our Lord, what did Jesus, add to that foundation of a good marriage according to the what's called the natural law, 
okay? So I tried to engage them very much and so that it wasn't just like a talk down fast and get, you know, ask them questions sometimes. And on paper, I would see that half of these couples were living together, okay? But the first time I met them, I didn't raise that issue at all. I wanted to become friends with them. Okay, so the second time, I would ask them, now what do you think the church, how do you think the church looks upon couples coming to live together before they get married? And some of them would just kind of look at me a bit blank, you know, and so on. Some would say, oh, I think the church doesn't really approve, you know, and so on and so forth. I said, why doesn't the church approve? You know, why doesn't it approve? And some of them would maybe make an attempt at a kind of an answer and others just, you know, just looking, looking at me to give the answer, <laughs> you know. And uh, so then I would explain to them, I said, look, I mean, you want to step into your marriage, not slide into your marriage, okay? You want that day of your wedding to be a definite decision at that point of time. Now something, I'm going to give myself to my spouse, you know. I'm making a definite step in my life. Otherwise, you know, if you're just living together and then you stay, to, you're just acting, you know, having intimacy and all that sort of thing, and your marriage day comes, big party, fantastic excitement, so on and so forth, nice meal. Next day, nothing really has changed. I don't know if all of them took that advice or not, but some of them did. I know that some of them did. The vocation opus day is sanctify your ordinary life, sanctify your work, your family life, right, your friendships by living your faith, trying to struggle to live the Christian virtues, you know, uh, with our work weaknesses that we all have. And, um, but there is that support to know one's faith well, to realize how to make compatible the different things we, we do in life so that all is offered to God. You know, all is done striving to live in God's presence. Okay, do, do we succeed? on and off, okay, I mean, we, to a greater or lesser extent, okay, I mean, okay, so, but, um, but that's the spirit of Opus Dei, that's the spirit of St. Rosa Maria, hmm? and that's something that the church has looked upon with great affection, because it realizes it's part of the universal call to holiness, you know, that everyone in the church is called to holiness, not just priests, not just religious, everyone. Obviously, are meant to be focused on God, and uh, if we're not focused on God in a, in a in a big way, then the priesthood kind of tends to fail, you know, to some degree or another. Not completely, perhaps, because God can do anything through anybody, you know. But if He wants to, and uh, so obviously, the priest is invited to have a real friendship with our Lord, a real personal relationship. We got these limitations, like everybody else has. We got. You know, our ups and downs, we got, but our Lord is really a friend. We know that, that he's not somebody who, you know, immediately writes us off the first uh, misstep. Hmm? And uh, he, he loves us. He keeps coming to seek us out and he wants to lead every person to himself eventually. He is a father. He loves us. He, he loves us from all eternity. St. John says he loved us first. You know, our thing is to respond to that love. So we need to pray, right? And we need to have, we need to talk to God. And prayer is many times just that, is just talking to God. Many saints have said that, you know, it's, it's a conversation. St. Rosa Maria said that. You know, the, some of the fathers of the church talk about that. You know, it's, it's not just saying formal prayers, it's opening your heart to God. I'm having a tough time today, you know? I, I feel very tempted. I'm discouraged because this thing hasn't worked out. You know? Uh, this person's giving me a hard time, what do I do? Uh, to speak to God about these things. How do I forgive this offense that I feel, you know? Well, then there's Our Lady, you know? The other day I was watching a video of a huge gathering of Mexican Catholics in the Basilica of Guadalupe in Mexico City. And it must have been the feast of Our Lady of Guadalupe, probably one year ago. 
before COVID. <laughs> and the, the, the Basilica is packed out, right? The, there's a whole, there's like a hundred priests there can celebrating mass. You know? And then the mass is over and they break into a big song to Our Lady, right? They sing what's called Las Mañanitas, which is the way Mexicans say happy birthday to somebody. Mm -hmm. They sing this song, which I think is a much nicer song than happy birthday to you. <laughs> okay, it's beautiful. And it has wonderful verses and things. And it's just so impressive to see the love, the affection for the mother of God, right? And, uh, and so spontaneous and so heartfelt. Okay, well, I, I would love to love Our Lady that way. The church always needs people who are going to dedicate more time to the needs of the church, right? Whether that's priesthood, the religious life, or being a more dedicated uh, lay person, you know, that feels the need to serve the church, but not necessarily in an ecclesiastical environment, you know, like being an acolyte or something like that, but discerning what is my way in life. Everybody has to try to work that out. But everybody's called to holiness. That's the point. Hopefully that begins with a little sort of tug in the heart, right? I could be doing more for God. You know, I could, how do I make my life more relevant to God or sort of more pleasing to God? Or everybody can grow in their Christian life, reach that, what St. Rosemary used to call the fullness of Christian life. We need help for that. We need formation, input, you know, we need encouragement, you know, that's why the, the church is there. Priesthood, specifically priesthood, well, we need priests, of course, we got to pray for that. Everybody's got to pray that there are more priests in this country uh, to be able, and, and priests who are loving, co committed, humble, ready to work hard, wants to serve the church there through what they do every day, you know, and, and and just to try to give that example or to try to attract people through their example or through their friendship, you know? Reach that, what St. Rosemary used to call the fullness of Christian life. We need help for that. We need formation, input, you know? We need encouragement. We're all human. We need prayer. We need conversation with God. We need the sacraments. And that's a lifelong thing, you know, just learning to be a friend of Christ. Shalom World brings to you the Catholic faith in all its different dimensions. It can be a faith to inspire you in, in your own living of your Catholic life in society. Shalom World offers you an opportunity of being rich and strengthened in your family life. We live in a culture that needs to have a Catholic presence. We live in a culture that needs to be evangelized by the presence of Catholic teaching and the inspiration to live according to our Catholic way of life. I recommend to you you're involved, to be involved in the work of Shalom World. May the Lord bless you and bless the work of Shalom World. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.